courageous thinker. He does not shy away from controversy or from the truth. He represents the best in what we like to call the black radical tradition and the black left. His journalism is in the tradition of Frederick Douglass's uh, North Star, of Paul Robeson's Freedom. He represents, in other words, the best of black journalism. The best of black journalism, I think, is that anti-racist, anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist journalism. Uh, but Glenn is also an activist. Uh, he is involved currently in all of those activities around the Occupy movement. Uh, he's involved in the Black is Back coalition. And he uses uh, the Black Agenda report to mobilize black and progressive people for struggle. Without further ado, I'd like to bring to you Brother Glenn Ford, who's going to talk this evening about Obama, the Obama administration, in the context of the economic crisis. So let's welcome him. Power to the people. Uh, as a uh, Dr. Montero said, uh, we've only face-to-face uh, -face known each other for uh, a number of years, but I've been aware of his work uh, since I was a young man. Uh, he, he's left plenty of footprints all over the place. Uh, and when we finally did uh, meet in the flesh, uh, I felt that, uh, that I'd been reunited with an old friend. Uh, I think I got the title to the, uh, to the talk a, a little bit wrong. I, I uh, uh, thought it was uh, and it's my mistake, I'm sure, because I'm the one who makes them, never you. Uh, I, th I thought it was B Barack Obama and the crisis of capitalism. Well, that's good and, and that's a really uh, large subject, so you may find me uh, rambling. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's difficult uh, to speak uh, without rooting uh, our talk uh, in the crisis of capitalism because we're in the midst of it. And almost anything that we say that does not uh, have the crisis of capitalism uh, immediately attached to it is probably something irrelevant and not worth uh, saying. Uh, capitalism is undergoing its most profound crisis, and I believe it's undergoing the most profound crisis it has encountered in history, uh, in its modern manifestation. Uh, U.S. imperialism is not going to make it, I believe, out of this crisis alive. And I can tell you that uh, for the first time in my life, I believe uh, that I may see, I, I, may, I may be seen out of one eye, but I may see uh, the end of U.S. imperialism. <clears throat> Not the capitalist system, but U.S. imperialism. And, and that's quite enough uh, to wish for, a goal uh, to have to keep on breathing here. Uh, 2008 uh, marked two uh, things that are very important to us. One was the ascension of the first black president. Uh, his mission is to defend the rule of finance capital. And that, of course, is Wall Street uh, for short. And all the Wall Streets, uh, the Wall Streets of London and the Wall Streets of Paris and the Wall Streets uh, everywhere. Uh, 2008 was also uh, the, a kind of crack in time. Uh, it was when, I believe, uh, uh, finance capitalism uh, entered its terminal uh, stage uh, of decay. I think that one day we'll be speaking of 2008 before and after, almost like we're talking about AD uh, and BC. So we're living in a momentous period of time. You don't hear whistles and bugles and bells going up uh, that signal to us that we are in a, a juncture in history. Uh, that, that uh, humanity will refer to uh, for hundreds of years to come, uh, but it's here, and all the numbers uh, tell us so. However, at this uh, momentous period in history, this uh, kind of crack in time, when the decay and the contradictions of centuries is coming to a head, African Americans are sitting here inert, immobile, and irrelevant. 
we have been neutralized and neutralized at the very moment in history when we were entering uh, this terminal stage of finance capitalism, this critical juncture. And we've been neutralized largely because there is a black man in the White House. And that, I believe, uh, defines our political crisis. I believe that just as capitalism is undergoing its most profound crisis to date, black America is undergoing its mo most profound political crisis in, in our history. And a large measure of that crisis is the fact that we are oblivious to the reality of the disaster that has befallen us. We're blinded by the only fact that many of us can comprehend, that fact being that we have a black president. And so even as this crisis of capitalism wreaks more havoc on our communities than on anybody else, we choose to believe that we are actually better off than we have ever been before. So this is a crisis of deep delusion. We know this by the numbers as well. A series of polls that were taken uh, in 2009 and 2010 and 2011, and these polls were taken by various polling agencies, show consistently that black people are the most optimistic about the economy and about their place in the economy and their individual fortunes in this economy, the most optimistic of any other group in the country when in fact we have been worse hit than any other group in the country, when in fact huge numbers of us have been laid lower than we have ever been, certainly in relationship to whites. Many of us, enough to tilt the polls, believe that we are better off than we have ever been and better off than 10 years ago. The fact of the matter is that 10 years ago, we were much better off than we ever were when compared to white people. And now, at the bottom of this, of this abyss, and we, I guess we don't even see the bottom yet, uh, we have hit a point relative to white people uh, that we were at 30 years ago. And yet still, people are thinking that these are the best of times. In some ways, we are much worse off than we were 30 years ago when we take into consideration mass black incarceration. So why do we think that we are better off? The answer is in one word, and you know what that word is. It's Obama. The very presence of a black man in the White House has blown our collective minds. It is a collective delusion, and there is nothing else to call it. There's no need to be polite. We're talking about ourselves. We're the only ones who will say it. We're suffering a kind of mass delusion. Since the onslaught, uh, onset of the foreclosure crisis, and it, it set in with black folks about two years before it became general, and that was in uh, the mid, uh, mid part of the first decade. Blacks have lost fully half of our household wealth. Uh, not long ago, about five, six years ago, black household wealth was about $11,000 uh, per median uh, household. It's now about $5,000. White household worth, uh, wealth is $100,000. Uh, dollars. So we went from basically uh, 10 or 12 to 1 uh, to 20 to 1. And that's in this very, very brief period of time. There has never been a period like this when we suffered those kinds of catastrophic losses, nothing resembling it uh, in the least. And yet black folks think that we're better off than we were 10 years ago. I mean, it boggles the mind. Uh, we have, uh, we are behaving as if the cataclysm didn't occur. If an individual lost half of his or her meager life savings and had no prospect for a job and all of his relatives were broke too and he was still insisting that he was having the time of his life and had never been better off, you would say that that individual was delusional. 
And when the people say that, we have to say that these people are suffering from a mass delusion. That, I believe, is the manifestation of the political crisis. Now, I'm not talking uh, just about our economic crisis. Uh, I just cited uh, one statistic. There are so many, and they are horrific. Uh, but the political crisis is even more profound, because if we are in a political crisis uh, which uh, manifests itself by our being oblivious to our actual condition, then we can never fight our way out of the economic crisis. So the political crisis uh, is, is paramount. The only crisis in black history uh, that comes even close, and I don't think it's really very close, but comes close uh, to the one that we're uh, experiencing right now, uh, was the political crisis that followed the death of Reconstruction, uh, when all the black congressmen uh, were kicked out of Capitol Hill and uh, various Reconstruction governments uh, were terrorized out of existence. That crisis saw the rise of Booker T. Washington and the rise of an opposition to Booker T. Washington, uh, which is usually associated uh, with W.E.B. Du Bois. It was a battle between Booker T. Washington's accommodation with white supremacy and accommodation uh, with the rule of very, very rich uh, white barons, rich white men, and W.E.B. Du Bois and his crowd's insistence on full racial equality, absolute racial equality. That was a battle over whether black people had the right to define what racial equality and universal racial equality meant. And that means it was really a battle about self-determination, how we define what we think equality is. It was a battle over how black people would relate to other black people in the world, in the diaspora uh, and in Africa. It was, in other words, a battle over what we would now call Pan-Africanism. Uh, against this, we see the philosophy of Booker T. Washington, uh, which was a very parochial and, and, and ugly uh, kind of philosophy. Booker T. not only did not embrace Africa or the rest of the diaspora, he didn't even embrace northern Negroes. He spent half of his time uh, berating and belittling these northern Negroes who didn't know anything uh, about the South. Uh, he was always lecturing about we can get along with our white folks and don't you come in here messing uh, with our relationship. He, he actually presaged uh, uh, the, 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 the white folks who talked about outside agitators. He was calling W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, William Monroe Trotter and other folks uh, outside agitators. So uh, this, this, this was a very parochial kind uh, of, of black philosophy. And he was essentially saying that we need to put ourselves in the hands of my rich white folks, the white folks uh, who support and finance the uh, Tuskegee Institute. Uh, that struggle between, uh, just to personalize it, W.E.B. Du Bois uh, and Booker T. Washington, it, it outlasted Booker T, uh, uh, went deep into the 20th century uh, and uh, it defined our politics in the 20th uh, century. It was an internal struggle that we had to wage and essentially uh, W.E.B. Du Bois uh, and his comrades won, or at least we thought that he won. W.E.B. Du Bois uh, figures heavily in any discussion of black politics, but there's a special reason that I want to talk about him here, and it relates directly to uh, Barack Obama. Uh, I had my little one-on-one, -on -one, a brief one, with Barack Obama uh, in December of 2004. Uh, I got 35 minutes. Uh, he spoke very slowly back then. He had not been on the national campaign trail, uh, so he picked every word, but I think he was trying to run the clock out on me. So I, I didn't get much out of that, out of that interview. Uh, and, but as I was leaving, trying to figure out what was useful, what I had gotten, except that he didn't think the country was ready for uh, a single-payer health care, as I was leaving, uh, 
uh, he dropped, uh, uh, dropped this phrase on me. He said, and I don't, I don't remember how, uh, what provoked him to say this, uh, but he said that the, uh, he volunteered that the differences between uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, Booker T. Washington were not uh, irreconcilable and that they could have been worked out. And my jaw dropped and I did not know what to say. Uh, these contradictions between Du Bois and Booker T. were so fundamental that they raged for more than 50 years. They raged into the 60s. They defined what black people's politics were about. And here is this Negro from Chicago telling me that they were not irreconcilable differences, that there were not uh, fundamental contradictions between the two. It, and, and, and it was shocking to me. This is why I was like rendered mute, uh, because uh, why would you want to uh, reconcile the, the differences. You would want the co party that is correct, uh, whose uh, strategy and philosophy is uh, for the benefit of your people, you'd want him to win. You wouldn't want him to be reconciled with some backward kinds of thinking that would hold our people back, that would uh, uh, thwart our progress. So why would you want reconciliation? I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what motivates this man. Uh, why would you want uh, uh, something uh, that, that, that does not uh, resemble, that does not begin to speak to some kind of uh, global solidarity, if not unity, among blacks. Of course you would want that. Of course you would uh, root for the side uh, that was not parochial, but was embracing, at least embracing, of our people, uh, if not all of human, humankind. Uh, you want black folks to determine for themselves the meaning of freedom. That is the essence, as I said, of, of self-determination. And you know that self-determination isn't a couple of black folks getting a McDonald's franchise or, or eight black men uh, getting some startup money in Silicon uh, Valley, as uh, CNN's talking about uh, all week, that it is something uh, that, that serves the race as a whole and hopefully serves humankind as a whole. So why would you be looking for reconciliation between something that is reactionary and something that is progressive and for the benefit of all people? I, I really couldn't, I couldn't understand that uh, until, and it was really kind of instantaneous, I realized uh, that Barack Obama meant that the differences between W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington could and should be papered over and that he was just the kind of guy who, if he were alive, could accomplish that. Then it became real clear. Now, I took about uh, two minutes talking about that, but actually it flashed through my mind in about 10 seconds while my jaw was dropped that low, <laughs> trying to figure out what he was talking about. But, uh, Obama was actually saying that W.E.B. Du Bois should have compromised with Booker T. Washington, who was himself the great compromiser and was selected by the richest men in the country to be the leader of all the Negroes after his famous compromise speech in, in 1895. This is compromise over compromise over compromise till you can't even get to the meat of the matter. But that is the way Barack Obama's opportunistic mind works. Obama would have favored a reconciliation between Du Bois and Booker T, whose mission was to reconcile black people to the role of inferior, an inferior status uh, under the rule of rich white men, the richest white men in the, in, in the country. And that is also Barack Obama's mission. He is dedicated to the task of halting any independent black political movement and halting it in its tracks. That is the essence of his black policy. And we have heard different permutations of it uh, for the last four years that uh, you have known about him. And I have heard of uh, different permutations of that since 2003 when we first encountered Barack Obama. He is quite consistent. His message to us is dismantle any movement that you might think about having. It's an un-American thing to do. <clears throat> he wants to declare that the black struggle is over. 
that it's done, that it's no longer necessary, that it's passe, and even that it's un-American. And, and four years after uh, that conversation that I had uh, with Barack Obama in Chicago, he was still saying essentially the same thing. And he said it right here in Philadelphia in, in that speech that, that I can never understand people uh, praised as, as brilliant, uh, his Philadelphia speech. He basically said that everybody's got problems, white folks got problems, suburban soccer moms and dads have problems, and all these problems are essentially the same, you know, so uh, don't take your own problems so seriously. He said that, that Reverend Jeremiah Wright and his entire generation don't see the world clearly. Uh, that they uh, had their minds uh, were unsettled and possibly imbalanced uh, by previous uh, struggles, that uh, basically they were damaged goods. And, and more than that, he denied that racism was endemic to American society, not just now, but ever. And whatever is left of residue of, of racism and he said this uh, a year before the Philadelphia speech uh, in Selma, Alabama, whatever is left of racism is so small that it can be easily overcome. In fact, he said that black folks had already come 90% of the way to racial equality. I don't know where he got that figure. Maybe from somebody with a hedge fund or something. Uh, but that was, that was his statement. Uh, and it was implicit in that statement that we could get that, that little 10% if we just voted for him and got a black president, and then it would surely all be over. That was his implicit uh, uh, in, uh, remark. Uh, but I, 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 I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. We're still supposed to be back uh, in 2004 in his, in his office. He gave me that uh, interview. Uh, because of a month-long dialogue, and it may have been more like a confrontation, uh, that uh, Bruce Dixon uh, and I, at Black uh, Commentator, uh, had had with him, uh, and that was in June, uh, the summer, June of uh, 2003. Uh, in that period, uh, every week I would go uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the website of the Democratic Leadership Council. Uh, the Democratic Leadership Council is the corporate bag man for the Democratic Party. Uh, they handle the corporate monies. The, the companies give it uh, to the Democratic Leadership Council, and then the Democratic Leadership Council uh, interviews uh, incumbent and, and candidate Democrats to see uh, if their philosophy uh, is in tune uh, with corporate America. And, and if, after going through that, vetting process, uh, the DLC uh, bigwigs decide that he could be trusted, uh, then these candidates and incumbents get corporate money and put them at a distinct advantage over the not so friendly to business uh, Democrats. So that's what the DLC is about. And during that period in 2003, uh, the DLC was on a huge uh, uh, fun, uh, uh, recruitment campaign among black folks. So every week I would go, uh, to their site to see who they had suborned and subverted and recruited uh, that week. And who do I find in the first week of June 2003 but Barack Obama's name? And th that was very uh, discouraging because all I knew of him uh, was that he was a very attractive uh, candidate, uh, the kind of political package uh, that one would expect uh, you'd hear more from. Uh, but I called Bruce Dixon because I was upset and Bruce was from uh, Chicago, and he'd uh, worked with uh, Barack Obama on a 1992 voter registration drive, and in fact, he uh, went to his wedding. So uh, I'm about to blurt out to Bruce uh, that Barack Obama's name is on the DLC list, uh, but Bruce is all excited too. He said, wait a minute, Glenn, before you tell me anything, I just came from Barack Obama's campaign website, and he has taken down the speech, this uh, anti-war speech that he made uh, in October 2002. It's not on his website anymore. Now, you and I, those of us who uh, understand politics and electoral politics know uh, that you don't take down the speech that made you famous 
uh, that made you uh, not a household word, but a, a well-known person, uh, just because it's routine. There has to be uh, some overarching uh, political reason. And if you remember, June 2003 uh, was right after uh, George Bush made his mission uh, accomplished speech aboard that aircraft carrier. Uh, he was declaring uh, that essentially the Iraq war was over. And although there had been lots of opposition uh, to the Iraq war before it started and in its early uh, weeks, there's nothing that uh, white Americans love uh, more than a war that they thought they won. And so support for that war had gone up uh, considerably in the polls, and uh, accordingly, Barack Obama had taken his own anti-war speech off of his website. So that's what Bruce Dixon had to blurt out to me. So I said, Bruce, well, what are we gonna do? Uh, everybody's looking at this guy, and uh, well, how do we deal with this? He says, let's call him up. At this point in time, Barack Obama was ranked fourth uh, among uh, the candidates for the Democratic senatorial nomination uh, in Illinois. And so uh, he needed uh, solid support uh, in the black community. Uh, he needed to get along with everybody. Uh, he didn't need anybody uh, poking around at him. Uh, so we called him up and got him on the line. And what we engaged him with for four weeks was a back and forth. Uh, uh, we uh, confronted him on uh, why he was a member of the DLC. Uh, he lied through his teeth. Uh, and said that he wasn't a member of the, of the DLC, although anybody could see the signs of, of the vetting. Uh, uh, we asked him why he had taken uh, his anti-war speech off of his website. And he said, oh, that's nothing, you know, you change a website. Uh, so here we have, you know, we're trying to figure out how we're going to deal with this guy, uh, and it would turn into a yes you are, no I'm not, yes you are, no I'm not kind of situation. So we decided that we would put Barack Obama uh, through what we called uh, a bright line test. Uh, we give him a test uh, and ask him three questions. Uh, and if he answered all three questions right, then he should not be in the DLC. Uh, and if he answered them wrong, then he ought to be in the DLC whether he uh, uh, confesses to it or not. And the questions went something like this. If I am uh, elected to the United States Senate, I will immediately introduce legislation to, number one, withdraw from Iraq. Number two, uh, repeal NAFTA. And number three, I will introduce legislation for universal single-payer uh, health care. Now, he wrote uh, and verbally gave us answers uh, to, to those three questions. And all of this, you can in fact go in the archives, this three-week-long dialogue between us and Barack Obama uh, is still on the pages of, of Black Commentator. You could look it up. When we looked at his answer, we saw that he had fudged uh, every one of these questions. Uh, that is, he was doing weasel talk and fudge talk, uh, and he did not pass. And now Bruce Dixon and I uh, have an another problem. This guy has flunked, but he's an up-and-coming and attractive candidate uh, who black folks want to win. What are we going to do? And we punked out, and we passed him, because we didn't want to seem like we were crabs in a barrel, you know, pulling a brother down just as he was moving on up. And we also, frankly, didn't want to be marginalized. So we decided that we would uh, let him pass. But there was another reason that uh, we passed him. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that I've been going uh, to the DLC's membership list uh, every week was because uh, uh, big corporate money uh, had changed the game uh, for local black politics. Uh, after giving us a respite of 30 years in which they did not mess with uh, black folks' democratic politics in terms of injecting massive amounts of money, they had decided uh, that, now we're gonna treat black folks just like we treat environmentalists and, and labor and everything else. We're gonna uh, put forward our own black democratic candidates. And so that was uh, that, that was the project that they had begun in 2002. And we saw the success of that project. They almost won uh, the mayorship with Cory Booker uh, in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, and then they moved this corporate white money that popped up out of nowhere into Earl Hilliard's 
a congressional district in Alabama. Uh, and at this time, in, in, uh, 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 they were about uh, to knock off uh, Cynthia McKinney uh, in Atlanta. So we were concerned that the terms of black political, electoral pol political struggle uh, were, were going to be uh, changed. Uh, that is, uh, uh, when these big corporations uh, would, would fund these business-friendly uh, local candidates, uh, they did so in the background of a white corporate propaganda uh, campaign that said that black folks were becoming more and more politically conservative as they entered the middle class. Uh, in fact, they repeated this as if it was law. Now, all of our uh, independent studies showed that that was not the case, uh, that simply uh, moving a couple of notches up in the income ladder uh, did not fundamentally change uh, black folks' uh, view of the world. But that was the line that was out there. A and uh, that could appear to be uh, the truth if these corporations could keep on changing the rules and the terms of the game uh, in these uh, congressional and, and mayoral contests. So that's what we were looking at. And we didn't see Barack Obama as uh, falling into that category because he was running for the Senate. That basically is a, uh, it's a statewide office, so it's a white voter milieu. And it's, uh, the Senate is a national office as well. And so senators speak to that national uh, audience. And we didn't think that those two things uh, were the same. So we rationalized to ourselves that we can leave this Barack Obama uh, alone uh, and focus on uh, these Cory Booker types uh, and, and such. Uh, and that also was very convenient since we didn't have to look like crabs uh, in a barrel. Uh, uh, we continued that policy until 2004 in August when Barack Obama made his real national debut and that was at the Democratic National Convention. And what did he do? What did he say? He said, there is no black America, there is only the United States of America. And that meant that he was going to erase us. Uh, and after that, we said, well, we cannot ignore him uh, any, any longer. And that's when black commentator and Bruce and I uh, began to intensively uh, interrogate uh, Barack Obama. I was telling this story uh, because uh, since we've been interrogating and scrutinizing Barack Obama for so long and such a lonely long, uh, people assume that, uh, that uh, Bruce and I somehow had it in for this Barack Obama. We've even been called jealous of Barack Obama and, and all kinds of nonsense. When the truth is, we avoided confrontation with Barack Obama uh, because uh, we knew uh, that would get us in trouble <laughs> that we didn't uh, want to be in. But I can tell you that we were terrified, even back in 2002 and 2003, rather, uh, of the prospect of, of him becoming a, a nationally uh, uh, pivotal uh, black, uh, black figure. Uh, because we, we'd seen how even Colin Powell, the war criminal uh, Republican, uh, ap appeared to have uh, uh, been a magnet for enough black sympathy that I think that if he had run for president in uh, 96, uh, that he probably would have gotten 40, 50, 60 percent of the black vote. So what about a black Democrat with all the skills that that very attractive package uh, that Barack Obama had? So, so we, were, uh, we were very, very afraid uh, of what would, would happen uh, when he became the selected one, uh, which he did uh, in 2004. We knew, of course, that he was bought. We knew uh, from the get that he was a member of the DLC. We didn't know how bought he was, but we found out very shortly. The man had not been in the Senate for six months before he had amass, uh, amassed a political action committee, I think it was called uh, Hope Pack, 
of $16 million. Now here he is, a freshman, just got there, six months in, he's got $16 million and he's giving out money to other senators. That shows how the corporations had zeroed in on him very, very early on, ensured uh, uh, by their donations that he not only would be able to take care of himself, uh, but that he could ingratiate himself uh, with others in the Senate. And we noticed that uh, the senators that uh, were uh, the beneficiaries of his largesse uh, were mostly uh, DLC. When Barack Obama uh, finally announced for the presidency, that is when the great shutdown of black politics began, the shutdown uh, being the beginning of the crisis. Suddenly, black people didn't have any political opinions. I didn't recognize black people anymore. Now we're talking about folk who would read between the lines of anybody's speech trying to find something that was anti-black even if it wasn't there, all right? That's the people I knew, all right? But Barack Obama uh, was never scrutinized in terms of his policy statements. It was as if folk weren't even listening to them. Uh, he would often uh, times uh, in terms of the field of candidates, make the most right-wing statements and take the most right-wing positions, and our people just didn't even notice. I'll give you an example. Uh, and this is from, I believe, 2007, uh, no, 2008. Uh, there, by that time, there were three candidates in the field, Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Edwards. Uh, the the uh, foreclosure crisis was now general because white people were getting foreclosed in huge numbers. And so there were calls for a moratorium on foreclosures. Uh, John Edwards took the position that there should be a uh, mandatory moratorium on foreclosures. He was on the left end of that uh, three-person uh, race. Hillary Clinton said that there should be a voluntary uh, moratorium on foreclosures. Kind of meaningless, but at least uh, some kind of moratorium, if only rhetorically. Barack Obama maintained throughout uh, that the markets uh, should decide uh, who gets put out of the house and who shouldn't. He was against any kind of moratorium. That was the most uh, uh, right-wing uh, position to take. Uh, and remember, black folks were by that time, already half wiped out by the foreclosure crisis because we had been targeted by the subprime. And yet black folks just did not even notice that he said this. And so, so we can see the, the crisis setting in, that it's not just that black people weren't making any uh, demands. Uh, we were not even hearing what the man was saying. We had somehow crawled into a, a, or erected uh, a kind of bubble. Uh, and we could, uh, we could see Obama and see that he's black and get all worked up and proud about that, but we didn't hear what he was saying. Uh, for the first time in my conscious life, organized black America uh, as it is, uh, made no demands on a Democratic presidential uh, candidate. That was just unheard of. Uh, the perennial demand, the, the, the demand you made if you couldn't think of anything else, was always, we need a Marshall Plan for the cities. You know, y'all gave the Europeans that money, how come you can't give us that Marshall Plan money? That, that came up every year, even if we didn't have anything else to say. Uh, but in the 2008 race, not even, not even that. Uh, here it is, and it's four years later, and still we're not making any demands of Barack Obama. And I'm speaking of grassroots political organizations for the most part and the usual suspects in the black misleadership class. The lockdown on actual black political speech has been almost complete since 2007. That's four years. This must be a crisis. Black people have been irrelevant, neutralized, and silent in terms of any uh, affirmative uh, demands for four years. So this, this crisis is not new. It's actually quite mature. And it is terrifying to think that it could go on for six more years. What kind of community will we have become? 
what kind of young people who have, who have been raised up to some level of consciousness of their surroundings, but ha have never experienced a, a, an aware uh, and demanding uh, and proud uh, and independent uh, and politically, uh, politically powerful black community. Uh, it's, it's so ironic uh, when, you, when you finally uh, put uh, an Obama defender in a corner and you've demolished all of their political uh, statements, they finally say, well, this is for the children. <laughs> the children, the children need to have this kind of black role model. Uh, this, 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 this is psychologically necessary. Yeah, we need a black role model that attacks Africa. Uh, we need a black role model uh, that badmouths black folks and, uh, and, and on Father's Day. I mean, what, what, kind, what kind of sick role model are we talking about? And what kind of role model are we going to be if we are the silent community that does not even speak up for ourselves simply because there's a black man uh, in the White House? Uh, certainly, that kind of bad role model uh, trumps any uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, vicarious uh, joy or thrill that one gets from seeing somebody of your race uh, in the White House. Uh, we, we, Bruce Dixon and I, we, we anticipated some of these effects, but we had no idea of the depth of the delusion uh, that would come to grip uh, masses of our people. Uh, it is this delusion that is the most profound aspect of our political crisis. Because we're not talking about the usual problems uh, that occur uh, with our corrupt and self-serving uh, black misleadership class. We're talking about a whole people whose minds are clouded by an illusion. Most catastrophically, this collective delusion occurs at precisely the time when great political choices have to be made, the time when finance capitalism itself has entered its terminal crisis. And that means that we have suffered an historical double whammy, uh, an objective whammy uh, from the meltdown of finance capital uh, and all the bodies uh, that we have laying around because of that, and the political uh, whammy uh, of being silenced, to silencing ourselves because we think that if we speak up, we might somehow embarrass that black man in the White House. And so we defer and allow the damage to just occur without us even defending ourselves. What is the nature of this, this capitalist crisis? Now, this is gonna be kind of dry, but the world actually turns on dry and cold uh, facts. Uh, this crisis of capitalism has unfolded according to the laws of political economy that were outlined by Marxist thinkers a century and a half ago. They were correct, and history has proven them correct. The central contradiction of capitalism is that the system requires ever-increasing returns on investment. But as those systems mature, the rates of return, and we're talking about the rates of profit, tend to diminish. Now this is a law. This causes periodic crises in capitalism. Uh, usually they're called crises of overprodu overproduction. And that means that people can't buy what the manufacturers make, and that leads to a crisis. Those capitalist crises are like the weather. That is, they can be expected. But they're not like the weather, because these crises become more frequent, and they become deeper and more severe as the contradictions inherent in the system accumulate. And as these contradictions accumulate, they start acting upon each other. The highs and the lows of these, of these uh, capitalist uh, uh, fluctuations become more extreme as these crisis, crises uh, uh, continue in time. As the process of production and then overproduction and then bust and destruction proceed over time, capital and political power become more concentrated. And when political power and capital become more concentrated, that increases the social turmoil in these societies. This cycle 
of quickening, deepening crises would lead to collapse unless new opportunities are found for dramatically higher profits or opportunities for outright threat, theft of things of value. Those things of value are cheap or stolen resources or an uh, opportunity for super exploitation of labor, of people. That is the rationale and that is the reason for the creation of imperialism. That is the reason and the rationale for imperialist wars. It goes back to the inherent cycles uh, of the system itself. Each of those wars has been more devastating than the last war, just like the cycles of capitalism. And at the end of World War II, the imperial powers were in ruins, all of them except for the United States. And the United States then became the super imperialist. And to understand how dominant the United States was after World War II, uh, six years later in 1951, the United States made 59% of all the finished goods created in the world. That means all the washing machines, all the hammers, all the nails, uh, all the goods that go through some kind of, of process of, of value added and enhancement, 59% of them came from the United States and that's why the United States was dominant in the world. The US was so dominant that it was able to revive uh, the old European imperialists, uh, but the United States often pressed for uh, decolonization. Uh, uh, in, in fact, uh, the, the uh, Geneva Conventions and these, these international laws on human rights and all this beautiful language uh, uh, was initiated when the United States was basically in control of, of the United Nations and could write whatever it wanted. Uh, they did that uh, because they wanted to create a more open market in the world without all these uh, colonial barriers to trade because the United States was uh, the, the king of the block in terms of, of commerce and could, uh, could dominate if those barriers were down. Uh, so the United States wanted to break up many aspects of the old colonial regime because it could better I exploit the rest of the world if that occurred. By the 1970s, the process of decolonization uh, was almost complete. We still had Portugal in, in Guinea-Bissau Guinea and Mozambique and Angola and such, uh, but essentially the decolonization process in most of the world was complete. Uh, and by 1970s,the,decolonization,process,in,most,of,the,world,was,complete,and,to,varying,degrees,the,previously,colonized,world,was,able,to,bargain,some,better,than,others,for,the,same,amount,of,money,that,they,could,get,for,the,same,amount,of,
that can be traded on their markets. That is what they do. They are not about making cars or making anything. They're about money reproducing itself to make more money. They thought that they had fixed these cycles uh, of capitalism. Of course, they were uh, delusional themselves because the same laws uh, that uh, govern uh, manufacturing capitalism uh, govern finance capitalism. Uh, investors continue to demand higher and higher returns on their money, but the system tends to produce lower and lower returns. Only now we have a post-colonial world and the imperialists could not simply steal the resources that they wanted in order to get their way out of uh, these crises, and they couldn't just enslave people as they wanted to. It's a more complicated world. There was no quick fix to solve the system's contradictions, uh, the kind of fix that they had by the old colonial uh, means. Instead, uh, the finance capitalist class undertook their version of what we call globalization. They decided that they would de-industrialize the home country, that is the United States, and set in motion a process to drive down wages everywhere to the lowest possible uh, denominator, and that's what we call the race to the bottom. And although that race to the bottom has caused untold misery to people all over the world, much more misery to folks uh, around the globe than it has uh, to us, and although it's hollowed out our industrial cities in the United States, it has not rescued capitalism, which is now ruled by Wall Street, from the inexorable laws of political economy. The men with the money demand ever higher and higher rates of profit, and the system cannot provide those higher rates of profit even with all their exploitation and their stealing and their price fixing and all of that. They still can't beat the inherent contradictions of the system. And so what do they do? They invented a new kind of money, uh, a kind of money that only they uh, can handle and spend. And they call that phony money derivatives. In 2008, in March of 2008, this was five months or four months before the meltdown, all of the social democratic politicians of Europe, most of whom were out of work at the time, uh, sent a letter uh, and had it published in Le Monde and the letter declared, we will not be ruled by fictitious capital. They were talking about derivatives. And these were former prime ministers and ministers of the treasury and, and folk who collaborated in the rise of these uh, derivatives. So they knew what they were talking about, that the greatest danger now to the world economy uh, was this new fictitious money that these finance capitalists had created because they could not get the higher and higher rates of return in the conventional uh, real economy, in the conventional system. And by the time these social democratic politicians were sending their letter uh, to uh, that Parisian newspaper, there were 600 to 1,000 trillion dollars in derivatives floating around the world. 600 to 1,000 trillion. Now, you don't understand that unless you understand that the whole world uh, uh, gross annual product, the planetary gross annual product, is about $75 trillion. So here we have a fictitious money economy, the money economy that the banks deal in that they register their profits in, that they make their bets on, that they bet the actual uh, pr uh, product of the real economy on that is six, eight, ten more times the size of the real economy. That means that they are disconnected from, but still hovering over uh, and ruling over a real economy. When we say that this is a terminal crisis, it is because there is no escape from it. Today, after 
Barack Obama has gone through this sham process and is bragging about financial reform, today there are still 600 trillion plus uh, dollars worth of nominally denominated derivatives in the world. They're still out there because the finance capitalist system cannot do without them. They are absolutely necessary for their survival, and yet they are bombs that must explode. There's a Belgian bank that needs rescuing uh, today. It's a bank that was bailed out by the United States Treasury, uh, and it's in trouble because of derivatives. Uh, the former governor of New Jersey, Corzine, uh, his small company uh, just lost six point something billion dollars because they're in the business of derivatives. These derivatives are time bombs and they're going to implode. And that is why it is inevitable that this system go through a catastrophic crisis that will make the meltdown of 2008 uh, look like a hiccup. This is inevitable. It doesn't matter what we do, this is going to happen because the contradictions uh, have multiplied uh, to, the, to the extent uh, that there is no way out uh, for them. But, there is, but they will try uh, to extricate themselves in, in the only way that they can. And that, since they don't make anything, and that is to convert the public sectors and, and everything else they can get uh, their hands on uh, into instruments <laughs> uh, that can be traded on their markets. And this is why hedge fund executives are in the forefront of privatizing the public schools. This, this is why they're putting their money, and it doesn't seem to make a, a, any sense from a Wall Street standpoint, but believe, it, believe me, it does because they control Wall Street. And they make the rules. They are uh, investing uh, billions of dollars in the charter school political uh, movement. They're investing many times that billion dollars in creating infrastructures of truly privatized schools uh, that specialize in all kinds of different uh, professions that they know are going to be needed because they control uh, the economy. Uh, they, what they are trying to do here uh, is to effectively uh, privatize the, the uh, educational system in this country while the state continues uh, to pay for it. That is the finance capitalist's uh, dream, uh, to make profit off of something that it does not have to maintain the overhead of. And the hedge fund uh, uh, specialist is one who can create derivatives based upon his projections, the kind of futures uh, of, of what uh, these, these different educational uh, offshoots uh, will, uh, will be worth. So we're seeing another derivative market being created on top of a public educational system. That is the only thing that a hedge fund operator knows how to do. So that is what they are doing. There is nothing else they could be doing. That's what they specialize in. So here is how they're trying uh, to solve their contradiction uh, today. They are attempting to monetize every aspect of not just the American economy, but this is what is occurring with Europe. There's nothing wrong with Europe. It's that the speculators, and those, mostly those are hedge fund people, those are the point men uh, for aggressive finance capital, are, are plunging the states into an artificial crisis uh, so that they will have no bargaining power uh, and can be subsumed by private capital. Uh, those parts of the state that are not directly privatized will be so integrated uh, into the financial network uh, of, of the Wall Streets of the world that they can then become part of the monetization process. Derivatives can be built upon them. That is what is occurring today. So no matter what we do, this implosion is going to happen. It, it is all centered on derivatives. The 16 to 24 trillion dollars in public money uh, that we know of, and we know of it be because the General Accounting Office tells us, that went uh, to these uh, US and foreign banks was all essentially to back up 
uh, derivatives. And, but what do they do? When, when they shore themselves up on one hand, they leverage, that is, make more bets uh, on the other. Why do they do it? It's not because they're greedy. This is what the, uh, the Occupy, Occupy Wall Street uh, <coughs> speakers uh, talk about, uh, that this is a problem of greed. It's not about greed. Of course they're greedy, but so am I, so are you. Uh, they do it because they must, because this is the only way that they can get those ever-increasing rates of profit that are built into the system, and that's why the death of this system uh, is inevitable. Which brings us to the Occupy Wall Street movement, uh, this very new thing that came uh, from some very white and very young and, and some might say very uh, naive uh, uh, sources. But the, Wall, the Occupy Wall Street phenomenon is a blessing, a great blessing, because it does us one signal favor, and that is it names the enemy and it gives his, ad his address. And the enemy is finance capital and the address is Wall Street. And once, once that, that kind of slogan is abroad in the land, then people realize, they say, yes, you know, that is true. That's why I'm in the situation I am today. Uh, so who does, this, who does this create the greatest problems for? Uh, I think it creates the greatest problem uh, for Barack Obama, uh, because the selection process uh, for his presidency uh, began where it always does, uh, the vote of the money people. Uh, they vote with their contributions. And Barack Obama was by far uh, the biggest uh, uh, beneficiary of Wall Street's largesse in 2008, way, way, way more uh, than John McCain. Remember, they bet on futures and stuff like that. And they, they bet on this articulate guy who could paper over the contradictions, even if it's W.E.B. Du Bois versus Booker T. Washington. He can paper over uh, the contradictions, they thought, uh, between uh, uh, Israel and the rest of the Middle East. He's so good that he can ensure us a more stable future while we continue to commit our aggressions. So of course the futurists, uh, the, 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 the derivatives folk, uh, would bet on him and not on crazy John McCain. And they're gonna bet on him again uh, unless he is forced uh, to do something that he will not do. And that is denounce Wall Street in any uh, way that actually uh, hurts. So it's Barack Obama uh, who has a problem and the Democratic Party uh, who has uh, a problem. Uh, they are a party of capital, but for electoral purposes, they have to pretend that they're not. And this uh, Occupy Wall Street uh, movement is forcing the issue and forcing it at exactly the right place, historically speaking. Uh, this will be something to watch. Uh, I, I, Barack Obama is a very agile man uh, who can contort himself into many positions, but it will be something watching him to contort himself into an anti-Wall Street position while taking the money. That's going to be very difficult. Uh, the uh, Occupy Wall Street move movement uh, has, more importantly to us, uh, presented a challenge uh, to this four years long silent uh, black policy uh, as well. Uh, it was, I guess, I guess I must be perverse. I found it, I found it uh, amusing uh, to see activists who had not been very active uh, for a, a rather long time uh, angry and resentful that these white kids uh, were out there uh, occupying places, knowing damn well that if we tried to occupy that place, there'd be blood all over the park. And so they're saying, how dare they do that? Well. These are the facts of life in America. Uh, we, we had a similar situation uh, uh, in 1964. If any of you remember the 1964 Mississippi Freedom Summers, uh, and, uh, there was a, a problem, a, a fundamental problem that the civil rights movement at that time uh, faced that uh, you could kill any number of black people in Mississippi or Alabama and the world would not take notice. And so it was decided after much debate, why don't we <coughs> import some of these young white people and bring them down to Mississippi? Uh, if they get killed, uh, at least the world will notice uh, and the focus will be 
on the injustice uh, of our daily lives. But you gotta bring the focus by bringing those white kids because white lives are treated as far more valuable than black lives. And the Mississippi Freedom Summers uh, was successful for that reason. Uh, in, a, in a macabre way, it was successful because uh, Swerner, Goodman, and Cheney, and mostly for Swerner and Goodman, got killed in, in, that, in, in, uh, in that project. Uh, so it's the same thing uh, today. Of course the white kids get to camp out at Zuccotti Park without much damage to, them, to themselves. Uh, and that's to be taken for granted. But that is to our advantage, uh, just as the Mississippi Freedom Summers were to our advantage in 1964. Uh, the other reaction, which followed uh, close on after the resentment, was embarrassment. Because here they were trying to move something. And we haven't moved anything in a very long time. And, and especially uh, in the age of Obama. And so what you, what you saw uh, as these black activists re ro shook off the uh, resentment and, and tried to overcome the embarrassment is a surge of activity, and I'm talking about stuff that just uh, occurred in the last two or three weeks, uh, a proliferation of Occupy the Hood, and actually a market increase in real organization in the hood by folk who were uh, picking up that mantra of Occupy. And it's the same people in the same hood, but they're doing much more work uh, in a much more uh, uh, coordinated, uh, 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 intense fashion than they were doing before because these white kids are, are working. Uh, so so, so this, this Occupy Wall Street movement is a blessing to us uh, in many ways, uh, but especially because of the fact that we uh, that, the, that the, the essence of our crisis is our quietude. If it takes white kids doing what we should have been doing to wake us up out of this inert, uh, neutralized torpor, then that's, what, then that's what we should have. And that's why I'm down with the Occupy Wall Street movement. I think that's enough. <laughs> oh.